I'm a little bit nervous, so pray for me. I'm always nervous when I'm up here by myself. <laughs> but <laughs> I want to say hi to everybody on Facebook and those who will be watching on YouTube later. We hate that you couldn't be here with us. Hopefully you'll get to maybe next Sunday or the Sunday after that. And we'll be praying for those who couldn't be here, and we're grateful the ones that can. Um, got a couple announcements. Um, on June 23rd, we'll, we're still having our picnic at the Ball of Amos Park. Um, and then that next weekend, we're taking up the bottle for the pregnancy center. Or are we going to keep it an extra week? Okay. So by the end of June, if everybody wants to donate some change or a couple dollars or a check, either one, just make it out to the Appalachian Pregnancy Care Center because they do a lot for the women in this area. Um, I want to pray for Mike and Christine because they're on vacation this week. They got to go see Shayla and the baby and the girls. We miss you all. Okay. I can't think of any other announcements, but pray that they'll have a safe trip back. I'm glad that Davy and Edie made it back safe. I'm excited for Davy's message today. And, and let us just rejoice and praise God today. The Psalms 118.24 says, This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Because he made us for a purpose. He made a plan. And we know that everything he does is good. You ready for the first song? Oh, sorry. If everybody that wants to and can can stand and join us in our first song, if you can't, enjoy and praise in your seat.
we just thank you. We thank you, God, for just, we thank him for making us in his image. We are his children. And he, nothing compares to the love that he's gave us and will always give us, no matter where we are, where we go, no matter how far down in life we find ourselves, he'll always pick us back up because we are his children.
give through the offering plate, give online, or just give of your time in helping others. You know, tithing's not all about just money. I mean, it can be praying for someone, you know, helping someone out in a time of need, giving an encouraging word. Because sometimes those encouraging words mean a whole lot more. And we know that, you know, whatever we give, God can multiply it and send it a thousand different ways. He can do so much more than we ever imagined. You know, it may look small to us, but given out of the heart, God knows others' needs, and he always provides. It may not be in our time, but it's in his time, and he will provide. I want to say a prayer over the offering. Now we come before you. We thank you so much for all that you've given us, Lord. And we pray that we can give some back to you. And I pray that you can use it and multiply it in many ways, God. We just thank you and we love you for letting us gather here today, Lord. And letting us worship you, Lord. We know that nothing, nothing is impossible with you. We just love you and we praise you. We thank you for all that you are and all that you've given us, Lord. And I pray that what we give back will bless many, many, many lives. We ask this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. So if y'all are ready to sing one more song, and then I'll turn it over to Miss Davy.
grace and your never ending forgiveness God no matter what we've done in our lives God you forgive us each and every day your grace is new every day it's something that we can't do on our own but God I thank you just for being there forgiveness more than we could ever hope for or ever need really and God, I ask your blessing on Debbie's message as she comes up, Lord. And I pray that all of our hearts and minds and souls will be open to receive the message, Lord. And I pray that it will reside within us. That we know that it is just from you, God. We thank you. And we ask this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Really good. Really good. I will move Jess's notebook and put my notes up. We'll get going here in a moment. I'd like to say welcome to everyone that's here. Really, really, really good to see Joe back today. It's been a minute. He's been recovering from hip surgery, so so glad to see you back today. I'd like to say welcome to those that are watching online or maybe watching later. We appreciate you being a part of our service as always. And I know our sound was off last week at the beginning, um, so I'm going to issue my challenge again. Come join us in 2024 in person. We would love to see you. And you know, a first great way to do that would be maybe come to the picnic, the, 20, the 23rd. You know what? The 23rd is mine and Ed's anniversary. So come celebrate our anniversary at the picnic. <laughs> uh, I don't want to tell you how many years. <laughs> Might be revealing my age. <laughs> I see Jess is a We the Kingdom fan. I love, I love We the Kingdom. We loved We the Kingdom, didn't we? That was an awesome concert. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. I've got a question. Have you ever done anything that made... Other people wonder if you lost your mind. <laughs> I think we've all, I better get these cords out of the way. I think we've all done something like that. I did that Friday. <laughs> I'm in, not surprised. The most recent time I'd done that was Friday. Let me, let me clarify that. Now, on Fridays, is, um, I get folders every day from, from my pods uh, where I work. And so on Fridays, if there's any kind of extra request, they, they come out in the folder on Fridays. So to make it simple, you know, I got a sheet of paper, and I've got the, each Friday dates on it. So I had the June one, the 7th, the 14th, the 21st, and the 28th. And so I looked through my folders. I flipped through my folders and looked at them and, you know, just see kind of what the day was going to hold. And I walked over to my coworker's office, and I said, you're not going to believe this. I don't have a single request for anything extra today. No, none of the three pods had any request. And I walked back to my office, and my mentor followed me over, and he said, well, we must have made a mistake because I know we had some things that we needed. And I opened the folder again, and then that's when I realized. I looked at the 14th date. All three folders I looked on the 14th. Next Friday. Yeah. <laughs> 
Of course they wouldn't even request for next Friday. It's not got here yet. <laughs> and I even, made, I even made the comment to him, I think I'm losing my mind. <laughs> <laughs> There's my son. These things happen. <laughs> well, by the fact that we've all experienced that, that will help us understand a little bit more what's going on in the scripture passage that we're starting with today in Mark 3. Mark 3, starting verse 20, says, Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. <laughs> Verse 22. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him, and he began to speak to them in parables. He said, Well, how can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, the house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. And then he can plunder the strong man's house. So this scene takes place early in Jesus' ministry. And so word is beginning to spread about his teachings and his miracles. And Jesus has come back to his hometown. And just like everywhere that he has been recently, the crowd follows him. The crowd gathers. And you know who the crowd is made up of? It's made up of people who know they need him. And they're looking to him for help, and they're following him. And that's why they do so. But you know who is not looking to him for help? We have his family, and we have the Pharisees. They're kind of on the outside looking in, and they're seeing all these things. That's Jesus. The people on the inside know they need him. The ones on the outside, they're looking, and they're watching. And his family thinks he's lost his mind. The Pharisees think... And the scribes think, he's of Beelzebub, he's of Satan, he's of the devil. So Jesus' earthly family and his friends, they really didn't understand what he was doing. To them, you know, they didn't grasp that he was the son of God. To them, he was just uh, the son of earthly parents, Mary and Joseph. That's how they knew him. And so the family... You know, they're, like, they're living in a small town. And one uh, thing that I read, information said that the town of Nazareth about that, that time would have been about 150 people. But listen, in a small town, everybody knows everything, right? And reputation matters. And here is poor Mary's son. This man's lost his mind. Look, he's coming to town. And so they go to try to intervene and take charge, take charge of him. So they're listening to all these other voices. But we're like that sometimes too, aren't we? We don't understand maybe what Jesus is doing in a moment, in a time frame, in our lives. I mean, it's, it's, kind of, it's hard to grasp. Maybe it's our lives, maybe it's friends' lives. We just don't understand. And so we make a rash, <laughs> uh, you know, jump to judgment. And we decide, well, maybe he doesn't care. And so we can be like the Pharisees. We can be like uh, Jesus' family. But even though Jesus, um, his family didn't get it, Jesus never wavered in his mission. He was consistent. He was steady on. He knew what his purpose was. He knew where he was going. And he knew that it was for them. He knew that it was for us. And it was nothing that anybody said or did, did that pushed him off his mission. He stayed focused. Well, because the Pharisees didn't understand what Jesus was doing, they accused him of being possessed by the devil. And they wanted to discredit him in the eyes of other people. So that's why they're saying the things that they did. But you know what? 
it had a big problem. There's a big flaw in their words. It's like, how can the devil defeat the devil? Does that make sense? So Jesus challenges them. You know, he, he doesn't take anything. You'll see that consistently in Scripture. Like, he turned the other cheek when he was being reviled on the cross. But any other time when he confronted people, he confronted them, right? He stood up for what was right. He stood up for the truth. He didn't back, he didn't back off. So he stood up to these Pharisees when they were claiming that he was a bills of hub, casting out casting out demons. So he challenged their thinking. He said, you know, I mean, a strong man can only be defeated by somebody who is stronger. That makes sense, doesn't it? And since good is always stronger than evil, good will always win out. And Jesus is the champion of all things good. And he will always defeat evil. And they got the connection wrong too. Instead of showing that Jesus was actually in cahoots with evil powers, Jesus' healing and his ability to cast out demons shows that he has power over Satan. And really, Satan, in the description that he uses, the parable, Satan is the owner of the house. And Jesus <laughs> is the one who comes in plundering the house. But really what he's doing, he's rescuing those that Satan thought he had secure in his grasp. So he is a strong man. He's the, he's the owner of the house, but Jesus is the strong man who comes in and really takes charge. So really, Jesus is Satan's greatest foe because we know that Jesus, not at this point, but later will be the reason why Satan is completely de deposed from any kind of rule that he has over this earth. Now, he may be running rampant now, but we know there is an end and he will be defeated. Or he is defeated. It's just when Jesus claims the throne and then it will be final from that point on. Yeah. So Jesus isn't, he's not what the religious authorities expect. So they don't have any idea what to make about him. You know, and when, we, and when we see a situation that we don't understand, when something doesn't fit our narrative, our way of thinking, then we typically, we're typically, we're kind of like the Pharisees. We label it as uh, abnormal or crazy because we don't really understand it when it doesn't seem to fit. Can any good be accomplished by evil? No. The whole course of history that we've seen of mankind to this point supports Jesus' claim that it can't. Evil will always produce evil. One example that comes to mind is Hitler. Hitler was an evil man. And he, and he did evil horribly unimaginable evil things to people. But, you know, division and conflict is not just something at that time. It's part of our world today. You know, a marriage divided is a divorce. A nation divided results in bitter politics or at the extreme, a civil war. You know, we've had one of those in this nation before. But I think all of us know what it's like to live divided lives, too. When our outsides and our insides don't match. Can we identify with that? That struggle, we know Paul describes that struggle. We understand it firsthand. We know that's what it means to be a house divided. It's when we, when we don't match up. You know, we're one person at work. We're another person at home. We act one way with certain people and then a different way with other people. Then our life gets divided into pieces. Our behavior, our beliefs, and our ethics became situational because I'm this way here, but with this group of people, I'm this way here. So the people and the circumstances determined my actions. So we have a work life. We have a family life. We have a prayer life. We have a personal life. We have a social life. And pretty soon, our life is just a bunch of pieces. <laughs> but thankfully, Jesus stands in before us 
as an image of unity and wholeness and acceptance. He's the stronger one, and he does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He puts our lives and our houses back together. Amen? Amen. Amen. So Mark 3, verse 28 says, truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all of their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Has anybody ever read that verse and been scared? Okay. I think, I think. Many people have. I hope when I get done, you'll look at it a little differently. Because it does strike fear into our hearts. But we need to understand what blaspheme means, first of all. If you're going to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you've got to know what you're doing. <laughs> what does that mean? It means to revile. It means to hurt the reputation of, to speak evil of, to slander to speak irreverent considering God himself. So when we revile against the Holy Spirit, what that means is we are resisting the convicting power of the Holy Spirit to lead us to repentance. So when Jesus issued his warning, it was because of the scribe's statement we read back there. In verse 22, what did they say? He is possessed by bills above. The prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So that's what he's, he's responding to that. I mean, we see many verses in scripture that talk about forgiveness. But then when we get to this verse, and it, and it speaks of of. of, of maybe being a, a place where you can't receive forgiveness, it does strike fear into our heart. So that maybe we're going to wake up on judgment day and find out that we're, we're guilty of uh, the unforgivable sin. But the truth is, if you have a concern that you have committed <laughs> the impardonable sin or blasphemed against the Holy Spirit, then that, that you're, you're, the answer to that is no. <laughs> because that means that you're open to God. You're concerned. Those who blaspheme, who revile, means that they are totally closed off from God. It's complete darkness. There is no repentance. There's no desire for repentance. And that's what, they, that's what these scribes were doing. They were look, looking at Jesus, who was the Son of God. And he was doing all of these things. And they were declaring it that it was the work of the devil, the work of evil. I mean, they should have known better. They were the biblical scholars. They were responsible for teaching people in the, in the temples. They were responsible for helping people understand God's law. I mean, they knew the prophecies about a coming Messiah. Out of anybody, the religious one should have championed Jesus when he came on the scene. Or if they were unsure, at least been open to the possibility. But they were not. They completely shut it down, shut it, closed the door on it, and decided, this is evil. This is bills above. Demons casting out demons. So they were, they were the ones outside condemning. So even though it was clear to most people that Jesus was doing these good works by the power of God, by saying that Jesus was doing his work by demonic, uh, demonic power, the scribes, they were rejecting the only one who could give them forgiveness. Not only did they fail to see the light, but they were calling the light of Jesus darkness. So that's why he said that. That's why he responded to them in the way that he did. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. He was seeing through to their hearts. So in this, so you can understand why it's unforgivable. 
because it's refusing forgiveness. So having decided that Christ is satanic, the scribes, they were not open to receiving his help. They were not open to the salvation that Jesus was actually bringing. I think today when we look around in our society, you know, we see, uh, and through history, I mean, you have people that have hated good and celebrated evil so passionately that repentance is beyond them. Their hearts are hard as a rock, hard as stone. As in scripture talks about when we accept Jesus Christ, you know, he, he replaces that heart of stone with a heart of flesh because it's a heart that is alive, pumping blood, you know, that it's open to the power of, of, of the Holy Spirit. To, to lead and guide, but when it's a heart of stone, it is closed off, and nothing can penetrate it. I mean, it's one thing for somebody to be ignorant about the truth and not understand Jesus, but when the Holy Spirit enlightens our hearts and we understand, but then we continue to resist, then there's going to come a point when the Spirit will withdraw from us. And when the, per when the Spirit withdraws from us, the person can't repent. There can be no forgiveness because the person doesn't want to repent. Because it is impossible for the human heart to repent the without the work of the Holy Spirit. We can't do it without the work of the Holy Spirit. So if we're shut off and we won't allow the Holy Spirit to work in us at all, to touch our hearts, to convict us, that's blaspheming the Holy Spirit because we're rejecting the, whole, the work of the Holy Spirit. And when we reject the Holy Spirit, we were rejecting Jesus, right? Because, but he's, because that's what, the whole, that's what the, the whole work of the Holy Spirit is to guide us to Jesus. Repentance for a relationship. And so when we closed off, that's, that's, that's why I say, if you're asking the question, you're okay. <laughs> you're okay. <laughs> well, good, good. I'm glad. Because you, when, sometimes when we read a verse and it just can strike fear, if we don't really understand what it's talking about and what it's saying. I mean, we all resist the Holy Spirit to some degree. We read the Bible, we listen to a sermon, we might see a church sign, we see a song, we hear a song, maybe somebody says something, we read a devotional, and the Spirit will convict us, and we feel that tug, right? We feel some kind of little nudge. That's for us. We need to respond to that when we have that little nudge, that little tug. But if we end up, if we end up ignoring it, that's resisting the Spirit because he's trying to lead us, trying to show us something. And we're resisting when we don't follow through on that tug. Amen. And if we keep it up, and some people do, they keep it up and keep it up and keep it up. And the more you keep that up, the more you harden that heart. It's like layer after layer. It becomes harder and harder and harder. Till I said, there's no light that can even penetrate it. And when there's no light that can penetrate, you can't repent because you've shut everything off. And we've done that to ourselves. God has not rejected us. We've rejected him. Verse 31. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived standing outside. They sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him, and he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. So what's crazy about this scenario is that the angel came to Mary, right, when she was a young girl, saying, you're going to give birth to a child that's going to be the son of God. Um, and so she, she knew this. She knew <laughs> what the prophecy was. But even with all of that, here she is. Like, she's listened to the townspeople, right? The neighbors 
Your son's crazy. He's lost his mind. And so here she's going to try to collect him. She should have been his champion, right? Should have been his champion. Instead, she was on the outside looking in. So Jesus' earthly family, they were concerned about his physical and his mental health. Yeah, maybe he has lost his mind. But Jesus was con more concerned about spiritual health. And that's in our lives too. You know, we go through things, we deal with things. We're, we're more concerned about where we are physically in a situation and how we're recovering or how we're responding or, or what's going to happen. But when Jesus looks at our life, he looks at it from spiritually. You know, how is what we're going through? How, what can he develop in us, in us spiritually? How can he ground? How can we uh, use that to deepen our relationship with him? So he is focused on the spiritual because, again, we're focused on the here and the now for the most part. But Jesus is focused on, a, on eternity. So true family is not just about a biological relationship, isn't it? It's about trusting in our relationship with God and the, and the bonds that we begin to, to develop through when we accept his grace that we uh, develop through other people. I mean, how many people have, have said, not the family I was born with, but the family I choose? I've, I've seen that a lot on things on Facebook. You know, and, and, and I know what that means. That means you know, th there's a problem in my physical family. But, but, th but th my relationship with these people are as close as any physical, fit physical family that I could have. You know, we, we develop that family. And that's how we should be in our church family. We develop these bonds of kinship and relationships and friendships. So Jesus defied the norms of who is in and out. You know, people were possessed by demons. There was those that were maimed, that were born with physical kind of limitations or defects. There was lepers. You know, there was the woman with the issue of blood, the Samaritan woman. You know, we've gone through all of these stories. And, you know, and, and people in that society thought, that, you know, these people were accursed or they were tremendous sinners, you know, worse sinners than anybody else because of what they were going through. Or maybe they were reaping the consequences of the sin of their fathers. Or their parents. I mean, that's, that's how they saw it. So they weren't... So, so when Jesus comes on the scene, you know, he is pushing his point quite literally home that anyone... Let me turn this back here. Anyone, you see verse 35, whoever does God's will is my brother and my sister. So he is pushing that point home of what defines family. So he redefines it. Family is everything. At that time, their physical family was what mattered the most. They had all the rules and the regulations and the hierarchy. And, you know, women couldn't do this. If you were a daughter, you couldn't do that. If I had to be a firstborn, something. they had all of these rigid protocols. So Jesus is coming at a time and he's redefining family and that kind of atmosphere. We don't see any mention of Joseph. We figure probably by this point, he's probably passed away because there's really no mention of him once he and Mary take Joseph to the temple. I mean, no, Jesus to Jerusalem when he's 12 and he's teaching in the temple. There's no, no record of Joseph beyond that. So when he says, you know, who are my mother and my brothers? He's, he's not being disrespectful. He's not disowned. You know, you could read it like he's disowning his family, but that's not what he was doing. He's not asking the question to exclude his family, but to set the stage for expanding the concept of family to include all of those who do the will of God. Amen. I mean, there's a difference between honoring your father and your mother and giving them ultimate authority over your life. Because parental authority always has to be subordinate that God's authority. I mean, I love my mother with all my heart. But if she was to tell me to do something that was con and she never would, ever. But if she were to tell me to do something contrary to God's way, you know, I follow God's way. So that, that's what he's saying. You know, that, that's what he means. 
So Jesus' whole ministry has been about announcing God's love and his determined to love us and redeem us no matter what. He chooses to be accessible to all of us. And when he says the word whoever in verse 35, I mean, that should encourage us. It makes no difference the color of our skin, our socioeconomic status, our nationality, our gender. Jesus doesn't exclude drunks, doesn't exclude prisoners, he doesn't exclude ne'er-do-wells. All, all who do the will of God are automatically enrolled in Jesus' family. I have a note I want to read. We had our nine-year anniversary, and I put a basket out there asking, what difference has the community, community kitchen made in the last nine years? And I've gotten some responses. And I got one, and this person, they signed their name, so I'm not going to show it to you because I know who it is. But this is, this is what he said. It's made remarkable difference. Very positive good to and for folks that have been stigmatized, ostracized, marginalized. Society has turned their backs on the unfortunate addicts. Anyone that needs help, they'll be helped here. Much respect, Deb. You can tell by the words, this is an intelligent, educated person. But this is a person who feels ostracized and marginalized. But he's found help here. And that's what we're to be. You know, we're to be family. We're to be welcoming. We're to be accepting. You know, we, family is it's, it's the bonds, the spirit of Jesus Christ that binds us together. And those bonds of family. And it just really encouraged my heart when I read, when I read that note. So it is God, as I said, that bonds us together. And it transcends our gender, our, our um, race, our nationality, our walk, you know, station and walk of life, if you're rich or poor. You know, the, the, the Spirit of God is priority. The Spirit of God is what shapes and molds us into this family. In just a moment, I have a movie, um, I have a clip that I want to show you. It's from a movie called The Way. And it's about a son that's going on a pil pilgrimage to find himself. He and his father have a very rocky relationship. And um, the son is killed, and the father has to go pick up his ashes. And when the father goes to pick up his ashes, he decides that uh, he wants to make the pilgrimage carrying his son's ashes. And he meets up with other people along the way. And it's a dysfunctional group, and they get along, and they fight, and they get along, and they fight. And, but somewhere along the line, they become like family. And that's really, that, that's how the church is, you know? You know, we're all these different personalities and all these different backgrounds. And we come together, and yes, we're dysfunctional at times. But, but, when we, but when we travel together, when we make this pilgrimage together, we become a family the family of God. But before the trip begins, the father son have this brief conversation. And through this journey, the father begins to understand his son's last words to him. And I want to show you just this brief clip of this interaction. Go ahead, Jonathan. You should fly with me. What? You should fly with me. Yeah, right. Turn the car around, pack a bag, grab your passport, forget your golf clubs. Come on, a father-son trip, it'll be fun. When are you coming back? I don't know. So you don't have a plan? We agreed that if I let you take me to the airport, you wouldn't lecture me about how I'm ruining my life. I lied. You know, most people don't have the luxury of just picking up and leaving it all behind, Daniel. Well, I'm not most people. If I don't have your blessing, that's fine. But don't judge this. Don't judge me. My life here might not seem like much to you, but it's the life I choose. You don't choose a life, Dad. You live one.
when we live life with Jesus, we're not on the outside looking in like the Pharisees or like Jesus' family, thinking that he was somebody who lost his mind. We're on the inside like the crowd, knowing that we need Jesus. And with him, we live a life that is meaningful, that is joyful, that is fruitful. And it's the place that we find peace. We gain a big family <laughs> for encouragement and support. We always have a place where we belong. We have a hope for a future that is better than anything, anything that we'll ever have or do in this life. A fulfilled life is not measured by the standards of this world, by success or wealth or fame, but it's by the eternal value of our relationship with God and with other people. That's the life I want to live. Isn't that the life you want to live too? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our most gracious and wonderful and loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the giving this opportunity to have a life that we can live, a life that brings more than we could ever comprehend or imagine that it will bring, Lord. The relationship with you is, is more important, more significant than anything else in this world. But with that relationship with you, Lord, comes so many benefits. It, it brings a fulfilled life, a life of meaning, a life of purpose, a life of hope. And it brings relationships and friendships and support and forgiveness and hope and so many things, Lord. And I just thank you. And I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to work in our lives and draw us ever closer into a relationship with you. Open our spiritual eyes and help us see just how wonderful and how loving and how caring and how gracious and how kind you are. We just thank you, we love you, and we praise you, and we honor you. And ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'd like to say thanks to everyone watching online for joining us and being a part of our service. I hope you have a most wonderful, blessed week. And we'll see you next Sunday.